Shall we open our Bibles to Mark chapter 11? Mark chapter 11. Father, we pray tonight that you would give us ears to hear and a heart to understand. And God, that you would make us strong in our conviction. And that God, that you would take every ministry that we have and use it for your glory. God, give us wisdom and balance and help us, Father, always to stand for your truth. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be teaching tonight before communion on faith in God. And there was an interesting guy named Charles. He was born in 1859, and uh, actually he did something very unique. I want to show a picture of what he did. I think we have the picture. There he is. He walked across the Niagara Falls on a tightrope. Um, but not only that, he carried his promoter. <laughs> I don't know. I, no way would I even promote him let alone be on his back. But that's not all he did. He went across it blindfolded. He went across it on stilts. He went across one time with a wheelbarrow. And one time he walked across it, stopped halfway, cooked an omelet on a chair, balanced on one leg, and ate an omelet in the middle of it. I mean, the, it, unbelievable. So when he finally got to the other side in the wheelbarrow, he says, how many of you believe I could do this again, going back, and everyone went crazy. And then he said, do you really believe me? And everyone, every, the crowd went crazy. And then he said, now who's going to jump in the wheelbarrow? And there was absolute silence. <laughs> no one would get in the wheelbarrow. So that's what I want to talk to you about. We can talk it, but we sure don't live it. I mean, it's easy to say that I have great faith in God until I get cancer. It's easy to say that I really do believe in God until I get attacked, and things begin to fall apart in my life. And so an interesting thing, he was a Frenchman, very good, and, and the gal here, she did it, but she fell, and she died eventually, but he never died. He died of cancer, and uh, he went on to be one of the most famous tightrope walkers and acrobat, and uh, what balance he did have. But faith in God really is encouraging to me. It says in Mark chapter 11, verse 22, it says, Jesus answered and saith unto them, have faith in God. Now you remember last week he cursed the fig tree and Peter was coming by and he noticed this fig tree and he remembered the words of the Lord and the tree was withered. And the reason why, it brought forth leaves and the leaves had no fruit. And the fig tree, there's always leaves and fruit together. And so because it was hypocrisy and because he was dealing with the priest in the temple and because he was dealing with the temple, it all had to deal the same. The nation of Israel is known as the fig leaf or fig tree. We know that uh, the nation of Israel became that fig tree. They also were rotten figs, according to Jeremiah, and God is going to redeem them. But now here is what Jesus is saying. Jesus answered, saying unto them, have faith in God. Because they marveled at once again this thing being destroyed. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart. That's the key. Do not doubt in your heart. James says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Does not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. So that's a lot of faith. The Bible says, if my heart condemns me, I have one greater. If my heart does not condemn me, then I have great confidence in God. So the key is that purity in my life, to know that my standing is right with God. And then he goes on to say in verse 24, therefore, pointing back to these verses, I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when you pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. And that is a great prayer. And oftentimes we pray, but we feel like our prayers don't even get outside the front room. They kind of hit the ceiling, that's it. Or we're praying, and we really don't believe it's going to happen. And so we don't spend a lot of time in prayer. But many desire to have tremendous faith. And the Bible says here that faith, in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, for I say Though the grace given to me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man a measure of faith. So every one of us has been given a measure of faith. You come down the hill, you step on the brake, you believe it's going to stop. stop. You hop in the car when you get out, 
unless you don't have a very good car, and you're praying that it's going to start. And so here you live in faith. You go home, you flip the switch, and you just believe Edison is going to flip your lights on. So we live in a life of faith constantly. But then you bring God into our life, and then we begin to doubt. And yet he's the one that made the heavens and the earth. He's the one that made you. He's the one that knows everything about us. And yet we will have more faith in a person than we will God. And that is the most fascinating thing to me in all my life. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8, For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, another the word of knowledge, the same Spirit, verse 9, to another faith by the same Spirit. Now this is the gift of faith. So there is that faith that's given to you, and then there's that gift of faith. Now, I do believe that God's given me that gift of faith, and it works in a very bizarre way. For instance, when we are in the middle of everything and, uh, you know, window and everyone else is concerned about the finances, sometimes I just have so much faith that God is going to get the building thing done. And so Wendell looks at me and says, now is your faith working? I said, yeah, God's going to do it. And so we all have a peace, and somehow the Lord does it. And other times I don't. And yet when the project's done, it's like then the faith is gone, and I come back to, oh, wow, Lord, how did we do it? And so there is that moment where God will bless you with the ability to have faith to get through certain things in your life, if the cancer, whatever it might be. But if I'm looking to God, believing in God, God has given to every man a certain amount of faith. And I believe that you need to learn to exercise it and begin to use it. And you can also ask for the gift of faith. And that gift of faith will take the worry and the paranoia away. I I don't think that I am concerned about many things except the teaching and so on. So I just believe that God is going to do it. And that is just the great faith that God's given. So here, without faith, it says in Hebrews 11, 6, without faith, it is impossible to please him. So that is the real nugget. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So why would I want to seek God? Because the reward is unbelievable. If I seek God like Asa, then God's going to be known. If I walk away like Asa, then I'm not going to understand what God's doing. And God said to Asa, the king, as long as you walk with me and come close to me, I'll work in your life in a wonderful way. But if you walk away, you're going to have difficult times in your life. So my faith needs to embrace God. Remember that man, it says, uh, Jesus said there on the cross, my God, my God, Eli, Eli, lama shabakani, why have you forsaken me? And to me, The reason he said it twice was because it's a witness. But to me, it's like one hand on the cross and the other hand on the cross, and I'm going to embrace this thing. I'm going to grab a hold of it. I'm not going to have one hand on and one hand off. I'm going to put both hands on my marriage, both hands on my ministry, both hands on my friends, and really grab a hold of this thing and do it for the kingdom of God, and no matter what the cost might be. And so a miracle is that extraordinary event that God's going to do in and through your life. And so with this tree perishing, it just drove these guys crazy. What happened? And Jesus knew it bugged them. And so he said, listen, have faith in God. If you have faith in God, anything's possible. And Romans 10, 17, it says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So my faith is going to be very developed by the studying of God's word. And I told you a long time ago, early in my ministry, I studied on the sovereignty of God and some of these other things that really paid off because I came to know the heart and the mind of God. There, it, God is not going to let you down. He's not going to forsake you. He's with you all the way. And the crazy thing is, is that he's not going to hurt you. Without God, nothing's impossible. But with God, everything's possible. It says here in Jeremiah 32, verse 17, O Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth. By thy great power and stretched out arms, there is nothing too hard for thee. So can he get you a job? Uh Uh-huh. Can he give your heart, your wife a heart once again to love you? Yes. Can he bring the kids around? Absolutely. Can he change a situation? Can he change you? Can he get you out of that difficult place you're in? Absolutely. Nothing is too hard for God. He can resurrect anything. He can start all over again if he needs to do it. And Matthew 19, verse 26, 
But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With man this is impossible, but the conjunction with God all things are possible. So without God, nothing's possible, but with God everything's possible. And then in Luke chapter 1, verse 37, Remember Mary, as she was talking to the Holy Spirit, with God, nothing shall be impossible. You are going to be impregnant by the Spirit of God. A seed is going to be placed inside your womb. And she didn't question. She just thanked God that God could use her body. That is the greatest thing in all the world. And then in Luke chapter 18, verse 27, he said, The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. So you're going to go to man, he doesn't have an answer. You're going to go to God, there's always an answer. So why do we waste our time? I Probably because we don't feel our relationship with God is that good. So we run to people, and they don't have an answer. In fact, they're hoping that you might have an answer for them. They're all messed up, you're all messed up, and yet we still will not go to God. You see, the human will will not surrender to the one who really made you. And there is that enemy seeking to say, now, wait a second. You sure you want to go down that road and trust God? You sure you want to give up everything and believe in God? And the answer is yes, I do. So four things I want to talk to you about quickly before communion tonight. Number one, the nature of faith. The nature of faith. Notice here in verse 20 and 21 of Mark chapter 11. By faith we see him. It says here, in the morning as they pass by, they saw the fig tree dried up, so they saw it. So they're paying attention. They see things. I remember walking in the uh, ministry of Costa Mesa early, probably 30 years ago, and Pastor Romaine was the system pastor, and his first name was L.E. Romaine. So no one really knew what that L.E. Romaine stood for. I knew what it stood for. But he was a military man for 28 years. He was a drill instructor. Well, L stood for Laverne. <laughs> so he never used that. You can see why. Hi, my name is Laverne. I'm a drill instructor for the Marine Corps. That just doesn't kind of fit. So when we really got mad at him, we called him Laverne, and that was a real bad mistake. But he would always say to me, Steve, you don't get it, do you? I said, no, I don't. I don't. He says, you don't see, do you? And he stopped me right in the middle of the sanctuary, and he prayed, God, open this guy's eyes up. Let him see for himself. And then my eyes were open. I saw air conditions. I saw problems. I saw situations. From that moment on, God just opened my eyes up, and I saw people hurting, and that gift of discernment came. Everything exploded in my life because I saw what most people don't see. You go out and have lunch. I have lunch, but I also see other things. I see buildings. I see wood. I see people. I see crooked tables. Too much I see. You know, it drives me crazy sometimes. We just walk down the hallway or walking on the street. My wife's holding my hand, and she sees asphalt. I see doors and windows and houses and who's watching TV, and it drives me crazy. But my eyes are open. So that's what God wants to do. He wants to open your eyes to see what's out there. They saw. So by faith, I can see God. I can see God in the middle of my cancer. I can see God in the middle of this recession. I can see God, what he might want to do right now in each of our lives. And so that means that you're never too far gone. It means if you're a teenager, you're just beginning. God can see exactly what you're going through. So in the morning, they passed by. They saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter called to remembrance. And I like Peter because he said, I called to remembrance. That means his mind was working. On the cross, remember, he says, I don't know the man. And Jesus looked, and there he remembered. It came to his mind that Jesus said he would deny the Lord three times. So he was always thinking. Peter was always thinking. He called to remember it, saith his master, Behold, the fig tree which thou curse is withered away. So if we're going to see God, then it says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I, I don't get it. You have to have faith. If you believe that God wrote the Bible, then you're going to believe everything. Well, how is he going to do it? God can create a guy out of nothing just for you. So if you don't see a guy that you want to date, then ask God to make one. <laughs> he can do it, you know. Just have faith in God. I mean, God can do anything. God can change your marriage. God can change everything. God can even take the heart of lust out of your heart and put the heart of God there to the day you get married. He can take that desire away, kind of like the chocolate chip cookies and the peanut butter cookies. 
He can give you peanut butter cookies if you don't like that, which I don't. And kind of so you don't sweat things. You're not being tempted so much. And so ask God to do it. You have not because what? You ask not. So if you're being tempted constantly with sexual things, ask God to take that away and turn it away. Well, I didn't think I could do that. Yes. Having a strong desire for God to be loved by Him. And then I have faith to understand in Hebrews 11.3. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God so that the things which we see were made of the things that do not appear. So electrons, protons, neutrons make up everything, but we understand that there's a building block. And then also, by faith, we can build. Remember in Hebrews 11, 7, by faith, Noah, being warned of God of the things not seen, yet he moved with fear, preparing. He began to build. So this is interesting to me. By faith, I can see. By faith, I can understand. By faith, I can build. And lastly, verse, uh, chapter 11, Hebrews Verse 27, by faith he forsook Egypt, Moses, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured, and that's everything. So if you're going to look at your life, you're going to look at four things. Why can't I not do anything? Because you don't see it. And why am I not understanding? Because you're not living by faith. And why am I not building? Because you don't believe in God. He can do it. And why do I quit so easy? Because I'm not enduring. So when I begin to live by faith, God begins to do a work in my heart, in my life. And so the nature of faith is to help you to see. It says Moses saw the invisible. He saw behind God. It says Nehemiah went beyond the rubbish and saw what God could do in 53 days. All the way through the Bible, it talks about Naomi came back and Ruth came back. She saw what she could have, but then she understood it says that the children of Issachar, they understood the times and seasons. They could run together as a marriage goes up and down, a ministry goes up and down, people go up and down. In other words, we're going to stay together. One of the great verses I like in the Bible is like I can say to my wife, my love for you is like the horses. <laughs> oh, great. That's really romantic. It is romantic. It's, it's wonderful because when you look at a stagecoach, the horses do this. And then they start to gallop, and then all of a sudden they do this, and now they're doing this, and then they're running together. And what Solomon was saying is our love is like horses that run together. In other words, we start off this way, and eventually we understand each other. We blame everything on the communist, and we didn't do anything. And now all we have is each other. We're too tired to fight anymore. So now we're finally in harmony just enjoying each other. That's what God wants. So number one, the nature of faith. It sees, it understands it's able to have tremendous ability to build, to pour your life into people, and then when you are so hurt, you can endure great things. Also, the object of faith, and this is so important, that's the nature of faith, but the object of faith is faith, we look to him. And this is where we make our mistake. We trust in a church, or we trust in a man, or we trust in somebody else, or we trust in our wife. Don't do that. Trust in the Lord. Put your heart and faith in God. We look to other things. It says here in verse 22, Jesus answered, said to them, have faith in God. Not in a ministry, not in a person, not in a cure for your cancer, not in something going your way or getting something. You put your faith in God. And whatever God wants to do, that's going to happen. If he wants to take you home, so be it. If he wants to heal you, great. If he wants you to die with cancer, so be it. If he wants you to live, so be it. It doesn't make a difference. God will give you the strength, and God will give you the grace to do it. What happens to us is we take our eyes off of God, and we begin to challenge God. How could you do this? Where were you? If you loved me, you would have been here. Why did my brother die? Her faith was in her brother being healed, Lazarus, rather than in Christ himself. When you put your faith in God, you will never be hurt. When you put your faith in God, you're never going to be let down because you're just going to do what God wants you to do, period. And God makes the decisions. And sometimes he heals, sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he opens a door, sometimes he shuts the door. Sometimes he says no to you, and he says, no, you do not go to the Jews, you go to the Gentiles, Paul. And so sometimes he says, the ambitions of your heart, no, I want you to go here. Well, how could he do that? He said no to Jesus. Jesus said, hey, can I get out of this thing? No, there's no other way. 
And for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. So number one, having faith in God. And having faith in God. Notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. And this is the great verse that you need to hang on to and memorize. Because this tells you everything. There has no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. Do you understand that? In other words, there's not a temptation that you have ever gone through that he hasn't gone through. And there's not a breaking point that he doesn't know how far he can take you. But there's always a way out, and it's through that window called Jesus Christ. Now, if I don't want to take that, then I'm going to suffer. If I don't want to be pushed or crowded towards that moment of Christ in my heart, it's going to be a difficult time. And so if I look for some other way, I could be crazy. I could shoot myself. I could commit suicide. I could reach out to the wrong thing. But if I reach out to God, it's a wonderful thing. There's no temptation. And so the object of my faith is to look to God. And then, number three, the ground of my faith. I think it's so important, the ground of faith. And notice verse 23. By faith we speak to him. And says here very simply, For verily I say to you that whosoever shall say to this mountain, Be thou removed. In other words, get out of here. And be thou cast into the sea. And show not doubt in his heart, but shall believe. Those things which he saith shall come to pass, and he shall have whatsoever he saith. Now, in Proverbs 30, verse 5, every word of God is pure. He is a shield to them that put their trust in him. So I'm facing something. It might be a Jericho. It mocks me every day of my life. It makes fun of me. It hassles me. It tells me how weak I am. What am I going to do? Well, what did Jesus do? He spoke the word of God to Satan. He says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. He didn't pray. He spoke the word of God. When Satan came to him again, he said, listen, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you everything. Jesus said, thou shall not worship anybody else but God. He came to him again and said, listen, if you cast yourself down, Satan, God will catch you. And Jesus said, thou shall not tempt the Lord thy God. So every single moment of his life, Christ quoted the word of God because that word was the fuel to his faith. So if you're not in the word, you're not going to have a great walk of faith. There's no way you can live like those men and women of the old days or even today doing great works of God without a devotional life. You're never going to rise higher than your devotional life. So when you look at people or you look at some of the great missionaries that have gone out Why were they great? Because they had a great God. It wasn't that they were great in who they were, but they understood the greatness of God because of their daily walk with God. And it's possible for every one of us to have that. Where all of a sudden God is loving you and holding you and caressing you and encouraging you and building you up and you don't need anybody else, but you are now sanctioned by God to go out into a dying world and tell the world about the love of Jesus Christ. You can do it. But you have to be, let God do it. And that means faith. That means I'm turning to God. And so my definition really of faith is bringing God into a situation. We have a tendency of pushing God out. I'll, I'll handle this myself. Guys do this really well when someone dies. I'll suffer. I'll go through it. Let me do it. Wife comes and says, can I help you? No, nope, I'll just deal with it. That's terrible. In other words, faith brings God into your life. Faith brings God into the situation. Faith brings God into the checkbook that doesn't balance. Doesn't, you don't fight the checkbook for a month trying to figure it out. You humble yourself and say, I, I'm, I don't know. And then God speaks to you in a dream. Or God speaks to you in a moment. Or God does something really bizarre. It's like I had this problem with this gutter at my house, rain gutter. And it was all complicated, really complicated. And it just kept messing up everything. And the more we tried to fix it, everything else, well, The other night I had a dream, and it was a simple dream. Just run it the other way. Oh, wow. I walked out, and I thought, and I told the gutter guy and everybody else, just instead of going this way, trying to do all this stuff and covering all the corbels, just turn it this way, and we'll just have nothing. But And the guy goes, that's brilliant. That's easy. Done. I thought, God, you're so good. Yeah. 
But, you know, or I, I can fix that carburetor. Oh, you can, huh? Oh, yeah, I can do it. And so you don't pray, and you feel like you should pray, and you know what you're doing, but all of a sudden you tighten it too tight. And you hear the voice, stop, no, one more, crack, snap the boat. Now you're in trouble. Or I can sow. I, I know what I'm doing. And so you sow upside down, backwards. You're like, what happened? Well, it's not that you, you can't do it. It's like, when do you bring God into your life? When do you allow God to help you? Well, you know, I can cook. Oh, God, help us. No. <laughs> We're all throwing up because you didn't let God help us. When do you bring God into your life? You bring God into your life with your kids, your life, your personal life, your looks, everything else. You, you ask God how you look. Ask God how you dress. Ask God what you should do. Ask God if you should go on a vacation so it doesn't turn into a vacation from hell. Ask God what he wants you to do because he might just say, I don't want you going. Well, why not? Because that place is going to be blown up with the bombs. It's, you, know, you might want to ask. Oh, well, yeah, that's a good thought. <laughs> Maybe he doesn't want you going out. Well, why? Maybe there's going to be an accident on the freeway he doesn't want you getting involved in. Well, are you paranoid? Not at all. But I'm going to ask God. Lord, how about you lead me and you guide me? How do you get that if you don't ask? How do you, it's like, I love Pastor Rob, but, and, but you know, he doesn't believe in GPSs, you know? I mean, the woman's telling us what to do, and he knows, every, he knows how to get there. And we're lost, but she's right, and it's a satellite, millions, billions of dollars, and just listen. No, it's over here. Okay. So I just leave him home now. I listen to her. She'll get me home. But it's like, it doesn't make sense. That little box has so much wisdom. Well, this little Bible here has everything you need. Just open it up. It gets you heaven, big time. <laughs> you know, no, no. <laughs> so anyway. My faith in God. In Isaiah 40, verse 8, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of God stands forever, always ever. You know, and then the exercise of faith, the exercise lastly. In verse 24, by faith we hope in God. This is the best. Turn with me to Romans chapter 4 as we close up and get ready for communion. It says, by faith we hope in him, verse 24. Therefore I say to you, what things whatsoever ye desire, when you pray, believe that ye receive them and ye shall have them. I want to give you four things to think about. Take home and jot these down. These will change your life. And Romans chapter 4, verse 18 is four definitions of faith. Number one, faith does not quit. Notice verse 18, chapter 4, verse 18, Romans. It says, Who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. So against hope, what did he do? Tell me. He hoped. In other words, there's no hope. He hoped. David said, they said to David, why are you sitting there? Your child is going to die. That's what God said. And David said, as long, he said, pre-adventure, as long as the boy is alive, there's still a chance that God might change his life. See, the greatness of David was that he believed in the mercy of God. The greatness of David was that if he fell six times or seven times, he got back up seven times. The greatness of David was that it wasn't because he was great. It's just that he understood the nature of God that when he was blown out of the water, he was able to get back up and stand with God every single time. What we do is we condemn ourselves and never get back with God. Woe is me. David didn't do that. He didn't play that game. When God was done dealing with David, David was done dealing with himself. And so here, against all hope, he believed. Was well, there's no hope. He's going to die. He has, pan he has cancer. There's no hope. What? what? Wait, wait, time out. God can give him a brand new body. God can do anything. Well, he, they can't have children. There's no womb. Huh? Really? Sarah? What about all these women here? God does supernatural things to remind people that it's never too late. Oh, he lost his leg. It's impossible. Really? They can grow another one. No. Come on, Stephen. You don't believe it. I do. I do. Right there. Boom. Number two. Faith does not stagger in 419. Being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead. He was dead. Nothing seemed to work. 100 years old, he's going to go in and have a relationship with Sarah. <laughs> he didn't look at his body. Well, I, uh, you sure? No? Okay, you told me to do it. We're going to do it. And in the Hebrew, he did a lot, a lot of times afterwards, too. 
I mean, once God got everything going again, he got going. So everything came together. And that's what it says in Hebrews. He says, he, I was dead, but at 100, we had a, we had a kid. So I, I can't go, I don't have to explain that, but he was weak in faith. I don't know if I can get to the bed. Wow, Sarah, man, wow, okay. That's what it says. He, he didn't consider his body. He didn't look around. Oh, I don't know if you're going to be able to do it. Forget it. If you say we can do it, we're going to do it. We're not going to look at our bank account. We're not going to look at our human resources. If you said we're going to do it, we're going to do it. We're not going to look at the personality or who we are or what we are, what the kids. You said you're going to bring them home? Bring them home. That's it. We're not going to consider anything else. The number three, faith does not question and Romans 4.20, he staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Fully persuaded, he was, he, just, he was not about to question God. If this is what you want, if this is what you want to climb this mountain at 80 years old, Caleb said, I'll do it. If this is what you want at 15 years old, Daniel, to stand in this temple and say, I'm not going to eat, then I'm not going to do it. I'll do it. And lastly, faith does not question and it says being fully persuaded here uh, does not question fully persuaded that what he promised he was able also to perform and so here are the four things very simply he did not stagger and he was fully he knew being fully persuaded that he that promised was able to do it so when i have this type of faith and a tree why do you think jesus cursed that tree because it really bugged these guys and then Jesus turns around and says, now listen, you can do the very same thing, but you have to believe in God. And I think, okay, I want to live that way. I want to see, I want to understand, I want to build, and I want to endure to the very end. God, give me faith in you, not in anybody else.